Well, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Jesus, Master Carpenter of Nazareth, who on the cross through wood and nails has wrought man's full salvation, wield well thy tools in our hearts, thy workshop, that we who come to thee rough-hewn may be fashioned into a truer beauty by thy hand, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, um, we are in 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. We're going to do just a brief review, a reminder of what Paul is saying to Timothy here. We need to do that because we actually didn't finish out the section last week. It's a very rich section, and it's a very important section. Uh, Paul is describing life as it's going to be in the last days, and we said that when Paul describes the last days... He's not just talking about those critical moments immediately prior to the Lord's return in glory, but the last days is a reference really to that whole period of time between the Lord's ascension and His return in glory. So what Paul is describing here is not a future time. Paul is describing a present reality, a present reality for Timothy in the first century, but also a present reality for those of us living in the 21st century. And here's what he says. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive. They will be disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Yombres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Now we said that Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy, who was a leader of the church, pastor of the church. Some have described him as a bishop. Uh, I don't particularly prefer that word for no other reason than when we think of bishops, we think of somebody who has authority over a, a large geographic area. That was not actually the case in the early church. Uh, he was an overseer but he was more of a pastor to the church in Ephesus. Now, he was going to take on a much greater responsibility when Paul died. And that's what Paul was preparing this young man for. And so Paul is writing to him to prepare him for what he's going to face as a leader in the Christian community. And what Paul describes here really is a downhill spiral. What happens, he says, in those days when people turn away from God. And what I want you to see today is the downhill spiral. How one little sin, actually one big sin, but one sin in particular leads to a whole host of other problems. And how it starts perhaps with individuals, but ultimately ends up being a problem for society, for families first, then for society, and ultimately for the whole world. So let's just do a brief review here. First thing Paul says is he says, Timothy, I want you to understand. I pointed out to you last week that Paul is very emphatic here, but understand this. And we said that that's rather odd, given the fact that when Paul was writing this letter, he was writing from where? Well, he's writing from a prison cell. That's absolutely right. He was in prison in Rome in the Mamertine jail, guarded by the Praetorian Guard, the very best troops that the Roman Empire could afford. And he was waiting trial for capital crimes before the emperor. And the emperor at that time was by no means friendly to the Christian cause. This was Nero, who was seeking to blame Christians for the destruction of Rome. So Paul's situation is bleak, and he's writing to Timothy, and he says, understand. Now, you would have thought Timothy would have understood. But I think this is just Paul's way of impressing on this young man that the difficulty that Christians are going to face in the world, in an unbelieving, fallen world, 
is not just a momentary affliction, it is a constant, constant difficulty. So he says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times or seasons of difficulty, which is simply Paul's way of saying it doesn't mean that as Christians we're always going to face problems all the time, every hour of every day. He just means that there are going to be moments when the sailing will be relatively smooth, but there will be other times in life when there will be constant pressure brought against Christians. He says, but don't think, even if you're having a period of relative ease, relative comfort in the culture, that this is the way it's always going to be. He says, recognize the fact that you are struggling. You are struggling against those who are in opposition to the Christian gospel. So he says, there will be seasons of difficulty in the last days. We ask the question, well, why will there be seasons of difficulty? What is, what is the cause of all this difficulty, all of this pressure brought against Christians? And Paul makes it very clear. In verse 2, he says, for people. People are going to be the problem. We, we have a tendency to think that the problem is out there in the world, that the problem is out there in the culture, and that it is the culture that has a tendency to corrupt us good people. But Paul makes it very clear that is not the problem at all. The problem is not out there. Jesus said the problem is where? In here. It's not what goes into a man that corrupts him. It's what comes out of a man that has a tendency to corrupt. So Paul makes it very clear there will be times of difficulty. The reason for these seasons of difficulty is going to be evil people. Why are people evil? Paul goes on to explain. Remember, Paul was a lawyer. Not in the proper sense that we understand it today, but he was trained in the Jewish law. He was trained to think rationally. And probably given Paul's background in Tarsus, what is now modern day Turkey, one of the great university cities of the ancient world, Paul probably had a very classical upbringing. So he was a great thinker. He was not just a feeler. We live in a very emotive society and culture. Everything is, depends upon how a person feels about it. But Paul was a great thinker. And you can see uh, the rationale behind his argument. You can see the logic and the flow of his argument. He says the people are going to live in difficult times, Christians that is, because of wicked people. And why will people be? He says because they have a misplaced love. I pointed out to you last week that, that quote from the Beatles, where the Beatles said, all you need is love. Love is all we need. Love, sweet love, it's the only thing that there's much too little of. All the songs out there. And Paul makes it very clear the problem in the world is not a lack of love. There is plenty of love out there in the world. The problem, Paul says, is a misplaced love. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be what? Lovers of self. There's the problem, you see. The problem in the world is not that people don't love. The problem is that people love themselves. And when they love themselves, a whole host of problems follow as a consequence. Misplaced love, love of self, leads to what? Love of money. Why is it that people want money more than anything else? Oftentimes so that they can feed their own desires, isn't it? To get all those things that they dream of having, whether that is power or position or prominence or whatever it is. We want the money because the money can give us the things that we want. This is one of the reasons why Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not that possessions or wealth are necessarily bad in and of themselves. If you look at some of the great heroes of the Old Testament, they were wealthy, propertyed people. Abraham was a wealthy and propertyed man. Solomon was a wealthy man. David was a wealthy man. The problem with wealth, my friends, is that wealth has a tendency to obscure what really matters. Being wealthy is not sinful, but being wealthy is a liability. And let me tell you, every single one of us is wealthy. Now some of you may be sitting out there thinking to yourself, well that's not me, I'm not particularly wealthy. Compared to the vast majority of the world, every single one of us is wealthy. 
every single one of us. And there are so many things out there in the world to distract us, to keep us from making Jesus Christ first and foremost in our lives. So Paul says, lovers of self leads to being lovers of money. Lovers of money leads people to being what? Proud. There's nothing that Americans admire more than the what? The self-made man. What's that old brokerage firm commercial? He did it the old-fashioned way. He what? He earned it. Now, I can't do it quite like John Houseman did it, but you know how it is. He earned it. We admire the self-made man, the self-made woman. But let me ask you the question, is there such a thing? <laughs> is there such a thing as a self-made man or a self-made woman? Every single one of us exists by the grace and the mercy of God, you see. Ah, but you see, love of money, ah, there it goes, a successful man. When you see somebody who's made a lot of money, we describe that person as successful, don't we? That's a successful man. Successful in whose eyes? In the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the culture, or in the eyes of God? The Son of Man did not even have a place to lay his head, we're told. Birds of the air had their nests, but the Son of Man did not even have a place to lay his head. Ah, but you see, in a culture where money is a god, a person who has a lot of it, well, that a self-made man. That's a successful man. And that kind of success has inevitably has the, the result of what? Going to somebody's head. So that they become proud. That's right. I'm successful. And that pride leads to what? To arrogance. And that arrogance inevitably leads to what? To abuse, to abuse of those who are less successful and are regarded as less than. But Paul doesn't stop there. He said, the problem is not just that this love of self begins to affect others. It eventually makes its way right into the home and the family. You can see again the flow of his argument. What happens? Well, all of a sudden, those lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, they become parents. <laughs> And they pass all those traits on to their children. When the scripture talks about the sins of the parents or the sins of the fathers being visited upon the children, I think this is part of what they mean, the affliction of sin. So what does Paul say next? The next thing you know is that children become disobedient to their parents. Violation of the fifth commandment. They become ungrateful. They're not satisfied with the sacrifices that have been made on their behalf. They become unholy. Everything's been handed to them, and so they expect that they can do anything. The word that is translated unholy here really means shameless. They're not ashamed of anything. They become heartless. And they become what? Unappeasable. In other words, dissatisfied. No matter how much you give them, it's never enough. Well, when you see people with a misplaced love, and that begins to lead to the destruction of home and family, it's not long before you begin to see a destruction of society as a whole. Why? Because the family structure, my friends, is the foundation of any society. That's just a fact. In all of history, whenever you see the family unit begin to collapse, it's not long before you see the collapse of society. Because family is the cornerstone of any society. It's where people are taught to live and to act and to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the culture in which they live. So when you begin to see family go, it's not long before Paul says, you begin to see the destruction of society as a whole. He goes on to say, people become slanderous. We said last week that the word for that is diaboloi. It literally means devilish, from which we get diabolos, the devil. All of a sudden, people in society become devilish, without self-control. The Greek word meant incontinent. Not being able to control their physical passions. And my goodness, take a look at what's happening out there with Kevin Spacey and Weinstein and all these people. What's the problem? An inability to control their what? 
their bodily passions. Paul says they become brutal, fierce. The Greek literally means, literally translated means animal-like. Rather than acting as human beings, they begin to act like animals, not loving good. Interesting to note that one of the fruits of the Spirit is goodness. But because they lack the Spirit, they lack the fruit of the Spirit. And it's not just that they lack goodness in a general sense. They have no real sense that there is an objective category of goodness. Not just your goodness and my goodness, but they're objective categories of truth and beauty and goodness. Now it doesn't matter if there are objective categories. It's only what you feel. They become treacherous, the same word, incidentally, that is used in Luke's gospel to describe Judas Iscariot when he betrayed Jesus. They'll betray one another. They'll become reckless, not concerned with consequences. One of the reasons they're not concerned with consequences is why. Because as children, there weren't any consequences, especially in an affluent society. They become swollen with conceit, puffed up. We would call them a swelled head. Do you see the downhill spiral? What starts off is not a lack of love, but a misplaced love leads to a corruption of the individual. The corruption of the individual eventually leads to the corruption of the family. The corruption of the family eventually leads to the what? The corruption of society. And the corruption of society leads to, ultimately, and this is where we are today, the destruction, the death of faith. See, Paul has been building his argument all along, and he finally gets to this point that they become what? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You think that's a picture of our world today? If there's anything that people are more concerned about than anything else is what? Their own pleasure. See, this is not just a picture of first century Greco-Roman culture. This is a picture of 21st century American culture, my friend. Now, you might say to yourself, and somebody did say to me when they left last week, well, that was really depressing. And I suppose it is. But what's Paul's point here? We said last week, Paul is forewarning Timothy in order to forearm Timothy. It doesn't do any good, my friends, to ignore the reality. It doesn't do any good to play the ostrich and stick your head in the sand. It doesn't do any good to play Scarlett O'Hara and say, well, I'll think about that tomorrow. This is the world not as we would like it to be, but as it is. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of religion, but denying its power. Now this is the apex of Paul's whole argument. This, this is where it really reaches its greatest point of destruction when a culture has the appearance of religion, but they deny its power. What does Paul mean by that? Well, you might say that in a general sense, people just become hypocritical. They show up for, you know, this is what they always, my, my grandmother, who is English, used to say about my other grandmother, who was Welsh. <laughs> she would say she would pray on her knee on Sunday and on her neighbor every other day of the week. Um, <laughs> It was an interesting family dynamic, let's put it that way. <laughs> you might say, well, well, that's what Paul means when he, they have the form of religion, but they deny its power, they're hypocritical. You know, they show up in church on Sunday and say all those lovely prayers and so forth, but then they go out and they live like hell. Well, perhaps that's what Paul means, but I think Paul is talking about something far more specific than that. When Paul says they have the form of religion, but they deny its power, I think he's talking about something very specific. Keep your finger there in 2 Timothy and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you have your Bibles with you.
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes these words, For the message of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the what? The power of God. Now that's the word that Paul uses there, power exousia. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul says that the result of this love of self is that eventually what will happen is that people will get to the point where they will have the form of godliness, they will wear all the trappings of it, They'll they'll have all the vestments, all of the sacraments, all of those things, but when it is all said and done, they will deny the power of the gospel, and the power of the gospel is the what? It is the message of Christ and Him crucified. Ultimately, that's what's going to happen. The aim is not just to get rid of religion. The aim is to get rid of Christianity. That's the enemy's aim, my friends. That's why Paul in Ephesians says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It is against spiritual forces of wickedness in the high places. The enemy is not simply interested in getting rid of religion. Actually, some religions serve the enemy's purposes. The enemy's purpose is to get rid of what? Christianity and Christ. And the way that you get rid of Christianity, the way you get rid of Christ, is you get rid of that which makes Christianity unique. The cross. You get rid of the cross. And we see that over and over again in our society. Now you have to ask yourself, why does Paul say the cross is offensive? I'll tell you why the message of the cross is offensive. Two reasons. One, because of what the cross says about God. The cross says that the God we Christians worship is a God of justice. He looks upon the world that he made, which was a good world. After each successive act of creation, you'll notice that God pronounced a blessing. He said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And when he made man in his image, he said, it is very good. But that which was good has been corrupted by human sin, by man's desire to be number one. Ah, the serpent said to Eve, but you will be like God. And see, it was Eve's desire to love herself above all other things, above God, that ultimately led her to what? To tempt her husband, and he ate freely of the tree as well. And the result has been this whole downhill spiral. This is just in detail. Read Romans chapter 1. Paul describes that same downhill spiral. And what the scripture says is that God is one who will not just ignore wickedness. He will set the world right. He will punish sin. You and I can be untrue to our word, my friends, but God cannot be untrue to his word. One of the things that he said to Adam and Eve there in the garden, he said, you may eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. If you eat of that tree, you will what? Die. And they ate of the tree and what? Now, if God was a parent like so many other parents, he would probably say, oh, well, forget about it. Don't worry about it. Everybody screws up from time to time. Let's give it another try. But if God had done that, what would that have meant? It would mean that we could never trust God at anything else that he would say. Let me tell you something. You've ever had children... They can sense fear in their parents. They're they're like horses. If you ride horses, a horse can sense if you're nervous, and he's going to buck you off. Children can sense when you're serious and when you're not. Oh, yeah, Dad's going to blow up. He's going to cause a big stir. Mom's going to rant and rave. But in the end, I'll get my way. How many of you have ever experienced that? Not with your own children, but perhaps you did that. (laughs) Or you know somebody else. If God had simply looked the other way, my friends, God would not have been true to his word. The only reason we can trust God on all of his other promises, 
All of those marvelous promises that are found in Scripture is because we can trust God that when he said they would die, they died. We don't like that. We don't like a God who is righteous and holy and just. Do you know that of all the adjectives that are used to describe God in the Scriptures, we think of all the adjectives, loving, merciful, gracious, you go through them. Do you know that the one that is used more than any other to describe God in Scripture is the adjective holy? He is the holy one. And to be holy means he cannot abide by sin. You and I think sin is a small thing, but to God it is an enormous thing. And yet because he loved us, he had to somehow deal with our sin and at the same time save us. And how did he do that? By coming down in the person of Jesus Christ and mounting the arms of the cross. And that's the second reason why we find the cross to be an offense. Not only because of what it says about God, but because of what it says about us. Oh, we can't be that bad. How many of you ever heard the old hymn, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Every Good Friday we sing that. Now we think to ourselves, oh, that's lovely. Listen to the words of the hymn sometime. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified him? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Let me tell you something, folks. You weren't only there. You were the, you were the reason he was there. You know, we have a tendency. Think of the worst person you can imagine. And then realize you're just as bad as that person. Whatever sin, whatever corruption, whatever evil or wickedness dwelt in the body, the soul, or the spirit of Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini or whoever, the worst child molester, I don't care what it is, you need to recognize, and this is a very hard thing for us, you need to recognize that that same sin dwells in you. The scripture talks about the evil day. Did you ever notice that the scripture says, lead us not into temptation? but deliver us from evil, it really means the evil day. What's the evil day? I'm going to tell you what the evil day is here, what the scripture means by the evil day. The evil day is when our desires and the opportunity meet each other. Let's be honest. There are times in our lives when we may have a desire to sin, but we don't have the opportunity. I may want to have an affair with Christy Brinkley. I've got the desire, but I don't have the opportunity. (laughs) There are those other times in our lives where we have the opportunity, eh, but we just don't have the desire. The evil day is when the desire and the opportunity meet. And we are all capable of it. Now, you might think to yourself, well, I never committed adultery. Now, we've already been through the Sermon on the Mount, folks. I tell you the truth, if a man even looks at a woman lustfully, he's already committed the act in his heart. How many adulterers out there today? I'm glad to see one honest man. One (laughs) one honest man. And there are a few women out there, too. Don't kid yourself. See, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on what? The heart. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom what? No secrets are hid. How would you like, if I could do it, for me to put up on the screen next week the desire of your heart this week? Please don't. Thank you. See, that's what the cross says. The cross not only has something to say about God, His holiness, His righteousness, it also has something to say about us. And the reality is, sometimes the only reason we've never been caught doing it is because the opportunity has never presented itself. If the opportunity was there, we would succumb as much as anybody else. So we find the cross offensive, my friends, 
And there are many people, even many people, not just out there in the culture, but many people in the church who have made it their life's ambition to get rid of the message of the cross. John Shelby Spong was the bishop of Newark, New Jersey. Still, still a bishop in good standing in the Episcopal Church today. He said, the view of the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of the world is a barbarian idea based on primitive concepts of God, and it must be abandoned. You want to know why we left the Episcopal Church, folks? It is not about sex. Don't let anybody fool you about that. I haven't even talked about this in a whole year and a half. I've never even brought it up. But I'm going to bring it up today. I know the mediation is there. I just want you to understand why we left. It has nothing to do with sex, except in an ancillary way. The whole issue is an issue of authority. And the whole issue at stake is the message of the gospel. Because you had people like this, the former presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church as well, saying, the cross, Jesus' atonement, his death in your place for your sins that you might be reconciled to the Father is a primitive barbarian idea that must be abandoned. Well, contrast that with what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians. God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. See, that's the difference, isn't it? <laughs> And that's what the enemy's aim is. Get rid of the cross. Get rid of these primitive notions of a God who would abuse his child in order to save you. Get rid of that. That's the enemy's whole goal. And there will be those who, he says, will do their best to do that. How will they do that? Paul goes on to say, they will infiltrate the ranks of the faithful and prey on weak people who do not understand, who do not have a robust, deep faith. They will prey on those, and particularly, when he says weak, their emotions. Now, don't get me wrong. There are parts of the scriptures that I find difficult. I don't wish to imply that, oh, I'm up here, and I just, this is no problem for me. I struggle with all of this. I, I struggle with the whole notion of suffering why there is the suffering of apparently innocent people in the world. I struggle with those things as much as anybody else. But the enemy wants to come in and he wants to prey on our doubts and our fears. And that's, that, that's how the devil works, isn't he? He plants the seed of doubt. Remember that old Flip Wilson show and the Flip Wilson line? The devil made me do it. I, I want you to understand something today. The devil doesn't make anybody do anything. The devil is a tempter. But he doesn't make anybody do anything. He never held a gun or a club to Eve's head. He said, when she said, oh, but God said we must never eat of the tree, what was his response? Are you sure? Are you sure you heard God correctly? And you see, that was the seed of doubt. And she wanted to believe that she hadn't heard God correctly. See, there was the desire. Here was the opportunity, the evil day. You'll notice that the serpent did the exact same thing, the devil did the exact same thing to Jesus. We're told that following his baptism in the Jordan River, he came up out of the water, and what happened? The heavens were parted, the Spirit descended upon him, and a voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son. The next thing that happens is what? Jesus is driven into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. And how did the devil tempt the Lord? If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down from... What do you mean, if? The Father had just declared him to be. It was a public spectacle. People heard it. Jesus himself heard it. But you see how the devil works? Are you sure you heard him right? You sure you got it correct? I always tell a story. I probably told it in here. I don't know. I teach so many Bible studies, I can't remember where I tell my stories. Just chalk it up 
to insanity if, if I've already told you this. But I remember we had in our backyard, in our last house, uh, a little tool shed back there. And we lived in an historic district, just like people here live in an historic district. And there were codes and regulations, and you couldn't paint your house without permission. And our two boys at the time were young boys, maybe nine, maybe 11 years old. And uh, their mother was expecting our third child. And she was worn out. And she was, she just, you know, in the afternoon she'd have a sinking period and she just had to go take a nap. And the boys knew that mom was weak at that moment. <laughs> and so they would come up to her and, and they would say things like, hey mom, can we, uh, we found some old spray paint, spray paint cans in the basement. Can we, can we go out there and, and paint the, uh, the tool shed? And she said, I think you better wait and ask your dad. Well, she went and took a nap. I get a telephone call over there at the office. You need to come home. Why? The boys have painted the tool shed. I said, what do you mean painted the tool shed? She said, they've graffitied the entire tool shed. And I thought, oh, the Board of Architectural Review is going to come down on us. Oh. So I went home. and. I, I said, what in the world were you thinking? I didn't even see the tool shed yet. I just said, what were you thinking? Well, we talked to mom. And I said, well, what did mom say? Well, we weren't sure we heard her right. <laughs> really? Well, you see, that's how. Now, you know how it is. I don't know which one said to the other one. You can just imagine. It's, it's the Garden of Eden all over again. Mom said, we must not paint the tool shed. Are you sure we heard Mom right? Are you sure you heard Mom right? You know, I'm not really sure I did. <laughs> and the next thing you know, <laughs> Now, I have to confess, they made it very difficult for me because when I got there and saw what they graffitied, they put, Jesus is Lord and John 3.16. And <laughs> which really made it hard to discipline them. But they got it anyway, because I had to be true to my word. Yeah, well, we got it painted over before they came down on us, so. There will be those that will infiltrate the life of the church and prey on the emotions and the weakness of other people. And they'll do it by imitation. They'll pretend to be doing this in the name of God, in the name of love, in the name of mercy all the while slowly eroding the foundations of the faith. What does Paul say to all of this? He says, well, take heart. Why? He says, they won't get far. Why not? He says, they won't get far because God always has the final word. That's what he's saying to Timothy. This is the world in which you're living. <laughs> Understand this. There will come times of difficulty. People are going to be lovers of self. They're going to be lovers of money. They're going to be boastful, proud, arrogant, abusive. They're going to be disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, heartless, unappeasable. They're going to have the form of godliness, but they're going to deny its true power. But as for you, take heart. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Take heart, because in the end, God will have the final word, as he did on that first day of the week. The world mocked, the world criticized, the world said that God had lost. But three days later, the man came out of the tomb, and he set the world right. And you and I know how this ends, Timothy. So take heart. That's what Paul is saying to his young protege, Timothy. Now he goes on to say something else. The next thing Paul says in verses 10 and following is he says, and remember. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and following. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, now listen to this, 
all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I want to read that again to you. What is Paul saying? He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Does Paul say they may be persecuted? He says they will be. If we are experiencing difficult times because of our faithfulness to the message of the gospel and Christ crucified, should we be surprised? Now, we may be shocked, but should we be surprised? Paul says no. He says, for you will be persecuted while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here's the critical verse. We're not going to look at it today. You're going to have to come back next week to look at the critical verse. For all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The problem in the world today, the problem in the church today, all comes down to authority not about sex. That's what everybody wants to focus on because we're a culture that's obsessed with it. It sells everything from lingerie to Uncle Ben's rice. I mean, you can't, I mean, let's be honest. If, if you think that it's not about sex so much in our culture, you can't even, you're not even sure you can let your kids watch the halftime show at the Super Bowl anymore. But as much as our culture is obsessed with sex, I want you to understand that's not what this is about. The real issue is, what is authority? What is the authority for the life of the church, and what is the authority for the life of individual Christians? That's the issue. And Paul says, all Scripture is what? God breathed. The old King James Version used to say, all Scripture is inspired. There's nothing wrong with that word, but you know, Shakespeare's inspired. The word that Paul uses here is, the Greek is theo. Panustos. Theo meaning God, theology. Panustos, from which we get pneuma, pneumonia, which is a, an infection of what? The breathing apparatus of the lungs or of the body. So when scripture is Theo Panustos, he said it is literally breathed out by God. And because it is God's word and not merely man's words, it is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correcting, and for training in righteousness so that the man or the woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So next week, when we come back together again, we're going to take a look at This is the world in which we're living. How do we as Christians live in that kind of a world in such a way that we are salt and light? The only way we can do that is if we understand the Scriptures. How does Paul describe the scriptures in Ephesians? Specifically, in Ephesians, he says, put on the full armor of God, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, have your feet fetted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, and take up the what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I want you to notice that when Paul says, put on the armor of God, every piece of equipment, every single piece, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate, the shield, all of those pieces are for what? Defense. There's only one piece in the whole arsenal that is not only for defense but for offense. That's the sword. You can use it to defend, but it's also intended to strike back at the enemy. But let me tell you something, folks. A sword is only as good as the person who wields it. So come back next week. And we're going to put the sword in your hands so that you 
can rightly handle it and live, and not only live, but thrive, prosper victoriously in these difficult days. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we give you thanks that we are forewarned. We don't like to hear bad news. We want everything to be wonderful and sunny, bright and easy. But that's just not the way it is in life. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. He didn't say you may have it. He said you will have it. Paul says, we're going to face tribulation. Indeed, he says, everyone who seeks to live a godly life will be persecuted. Lord, if we're not being persecuted, that may be a sign that we're not living a godly life. So, Lord, grant us the courage in these days. The faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Grant us the grace to rise to the occasion and equip us. Make us a people of your word that we may go forth, not being conquered, but conquering. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.